Hi guys, welcome to another Monday Night Study. Today we want to be talking about uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. Uh, we, over the past three or four weeks, we started off talking about the rapture and we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 together, because most people don't do that. And then we had uh, the 4th of July coming up, so we stopped and talked about the Constitution. Uh, and then last Monday was the 4th of July, so we didn't have a broadcast. So today we want to continue with that. And it's really interesting. I just wanted to share a couple things with you that most people don't uh, mention when they talk about this. And so if we go to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm using the LITV version, which is the literal version. And just a little bit easier to see some stuff. But it's really close to our King James that we normally use. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, well, actually, let me back up for that. When we looked at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, we saw the chapter 4 just talked about the rapture, that it that is, is an event, but not where necessarily. And we continued the discussion into chapter 5, and chapter 5 basically said, you don't have any reason to, to for me to write to you the where's, because you should already know that. And the way that it was written, we found out he was quoting or alluding to Daniel chapter 12. And in Daniel chapter 12, it very clearly shows that there is a rapture resurrection, and you can go back and look at the study from a few weeks ago. But there's a rapture resurrection, and then there's 1260 days or a time, time and a half. Then there is a uh, a major persecution and the establishment of an abomination that makes desolate. And from that time forward, there's 1290 days till the end when all these things are completed. So just looking at it like that, not trying to pinpoint exactly how the overlaps work. But we saw that 1260 is not the same thing as 1290. And so if there's a rapture resurrection, three and a half years to an abomination of desolation and three and a half years to the end, that's a pre-trib rapture. So that's what we were talking about. And so the interesting thing about it is Paul is, and we're going to see this tonight, Paul was actually there teaching prophecy. Somebody kind of messed them up. So he writes 1 Thessalonians which we've studied a few weeks back, and then everything is fine, but as we're going to see, somebody uh, is trying to teach heresy or mess people up, and they write a fake letter in the name of Paul, and it's it's referred to as Third uh, Thessalonians. To my knowledge, it doesn't actually exist anymore anyway, but it's a fake writing, and so Paul writes Second Thessalonians to talk about several things. One is prophecy, again, to set the record straight, and he mentions this problem. So he starts off in chapter 2, verse 1, says, And so, brothers, we entreat you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. So first, let's look at this. When you see the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that could be a second coming. It could be a rapture. It could be maybe several things, but it's just when the Lord comes to do something. But in this case, he's saying the coming of our Lord and what kind of coming. It's when we are gathered to him. So that's got to be a rapture. So we're talking about the rapture. So at this point, whether it's pre-mid or post, we're talking about when the Lord comes to rapture us. That's the point of 2 Thessalonians, not the second coming. So we continue with this. He says, don't be quickly shaken in mind or be disturbed neither through spirit nor speech, nor a letter as through us that the day of Christ has come. So whether someone says they read a letter or you read, there's actually this letter saying blah, 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 signed Paul. He's saying if there is such a thing and you find it or someone's saying that, remember when I was with you, what I said, what I said in First Thessalonians and what I'm about to say now, that's not me. So so don't be disturbed. And apparently this letter said that the day of Christ has come. Now it's interesting here, we have day of Christ. Some manuscripts have day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord specifically is the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's that seven year period mentioned in Daniel chapter nine. And the reason we know this is because uh, in Zephaniah, and in Joel and a few other places, Amos is another one. It talks about during the day of the Lord 
is when the animals attack. And if you go to the book of Revelation, you're going to see uh, the first three chapters are all about the church age. And then four and five is about the preparation for the tribulation period. And then that tribulation period is from chapters six to 18. 19 is the second coming, 20 is the millennial reign. So in there, we see in the first seals, actually, we see animals attack. So the day of the Lord is that entire thing. And I know a lot of people debate that. Uh, that's a whole other study in itself. But we're talking about the day of Christ or the day of the Lord. So somebody is saying that, oh, oh, oh my goodness, something's happened and the day of the Lord has started. The Antichrist has been revealed, probably Nero or somebody, and the persecutions have started. And I'm sure there were persecutions going on. But it's all started. And if we believe in a pre-trib rapture, as we interpret 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 to be alluding to Daniel talking about, then all of a sudden somebody says, uh, it started. Well, why am I here then? Did I miss the rapture? It's causing mass confusion. And he's saying, no matter what's going on, if somebody tells you the day of the Lord has started, don't believe them. Because number one, you wouldn't be here. We've already established that in 1 Thessalonians. But he explains it better in here. So if someone says that, don't believe them. And so verse 3 is the key. He says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Because that day will not come. So that seven year period will not come or even start. Until there comes a falling away first. And the man of sin is revealed who is the son of perdition. And he opposes himself uh, and exalts himself over, he's the opposing one, exalts himself over everything being called God or every object of worship. So to Jews, he would actually say, I am the Christ. I am Messiah. And this is what Jesus warned about. Many people would come saying, I'm Christ. He's going to do the same thing. And he goes so far as to set in the temple of God as God or as Messiah setting forth himself that he is God. So that's that's the whole point. And he says, do you not remember when I was with you, I told you these things? And so that's kind of the key. <coughs> Excuse me. I still have a bit of a cough. Uh, let's see here. So one of the things I want to show to you, that's the first point. But in this, he says, first, there is a falling away. And then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So I want to look at this phrase, falling away. And what's interesting about it is, um, it, it, it's the word apostasia. And a falling away is a departure of something. So if I was raised Christian and I depart from my faith and go become a Buddhist or something, I have apostatized. But as we're going to see, it means other things also. So let me uh, go to something else here. And this is from my rapture book a ways back. And we've looked at a few things. But in here, this is a, a study, one chapter on it about that particular word. So it's the word apostasia. It's Strong's Greek word number 646. And it's translated in the King James as a falling away. Um, and it actually means departure. So, for instance, uh, if we look at it as a noun, just the noun part, it only occurs twice in Scripture. Number one is here in 2 Thessalonians, so we're not sure what the falling away is. The other place is in Acts 21.21, 21, and it says they're accusing Paul of teaching heresy, and it says, They are informed of thee that thou teach the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake that's departure or apostatize, Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children or walk after the customs. So obviously here that's a good indication that the word apostasy means what we think of it is an apostasy from faith. Depart from being Jewish and go be another religion is what they're, they're doing it. <clears throat> so that's the only two things we see. But the thing is, if you look at it in the verb form, uh, apostasia is episteme, and it's Strong's word number or, uh, 868, Strong's Greek right here. 
And so when we see it, it actually occurs another some 17 times. So let's look at those verses and see how it's translated. So we'll read just uh, a few of these, or maybe most of them if we have time. So in Luke 2, 37, remember these are all episteme or apostasia words. Uh, Anna was a widow of about four score years, and she departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers day and night. So that doesn't mean that she never, ever set foot outside the temple, but she probably went home, ate, went shopping, did whatever. But every day or every weekday, whatever it is, you would find her almost every single day in the temple teaching prophecy. And so she never departed from that. She never like took a vacation or decided to get remarried and, and move somewhere and never showed up at the temple again. So departed. So that's not an apostasy of faith, but that means leaving the temple. In this one here, Luke 4.13, it says, When the devil had ended, uh, ended all temptation, he departed from him for a season. So the devil kept throwing temptations at Jesus, and it didn't work. And finally, he just stopped uh, for a while. He departed until he could figure out some other way, and then he would come back and hit Jesus again. So in other words, Satan didn't change or his religion, but he left. And here's Luke 8, 13. On the, on the rock, they that are on the rock, uh, when they hear and receive the word from joy, they have no root, they believe for a while, and in a time of temptation, they fall away. So in this case, that's the, the parable of the soils, and some people accept the Lord and others don't, and some fall away because of persecution. So in this case, I would say that's they depart from being Christian or what they said they were. So that is an apostasy the way we think of, but it's still a departure or a falling away. So you can see it used a lot of different ways. Uh, Luke 13, 27. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not when she are. Depart from me, all ye that work iniquity. So those people that say, Jesus, you know, haven't we been with you uh, all this time? And he says, I never knew you. Depart. Apostatize. Go away. Walk away. So uh, in this case, they haven't changed what they believe, but he's telling them to walk out the door, go away, depart. Acts 5, 37 and 38 says, and this is in here twice, after this, a man rose up, talking about people that have uh, been part of the Sicarii or the, the zealots and fighting against Rome. One guy did this and was destroyed. And then it says, after this, a man rose up one Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing. It's, it's kind of interesting, too, if you read Jose, um, Eusebius, he'll give you more information about these guys, where they were from, what exactly happened. So Eusebius is a great uh, early church uh, historian. But anyway, this guy Judas of Galilee drew away much people after him. So most people would say, we don't like the Pharisees, but we're not going to fight against anybody. That's our theology. And he changed their mind to where they would go away, become a zealot, and fight. So in a sense, that's an apostasy. They've changed part of their doctrine, but they've departed from their practice or their belief, at least in some, some way. So a departing. And all that obeyed him were dispersed. They all perished. And I say to you, refrain from these men, let them alone, for if this counsel be of God, or of men rather, it will come to naught. So this is what Gamaliel is telling Paul. So in, in this case, he made them depart from what he believed, and he's saying depart from men like that. So if I all of a sudden start teaching heresy, you need to click that little button and turn me off. You need to depart and leave wacky Ken alone. And so this is what's going on here. Refrain, depart, apostatize. I used to believe Ken, but he went weird. So now I'm, I got nothing to do with Ken. So here's Acts 12, 10. This is when the, the angel broke Peter out of jail. When they were uh, past the first and the second ward, the angel's guiding him all the way out of the prison. Uh, he came to the iron gate that leads to the city. 
which opened to them of its own accord, which is kind of cool. They went out and passed on to the street. So he's completely out of the prison now. So then the angel departed from him. Uh, not an apostasy. The angel came and got him out of prison, said, now you're free. Go that way. I'm going this way. And he departed. So he just left. So a few more here. Um, Acts 15. Paul thought it not good to take him with him, Barnabas, or Mark rather, who departed from them from Pamphylia when he went not from them for the work. So Paul and Barnabas on a missionary trip took Mark with them. Mark got homesick and departed from them. He went home. And it's like, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. Now, later on, Mark grows up and he becomes a very good help to Paul. But that's later on in life when he's still kind of young and wishy-washy. We don't want him part of the ministry yet because he keeps running home. He departs, doesn't apostatize. But he departs. So Acts 19, 9, when the uh, uh, when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannius. So he was in a synagogue. Uh, they wouldn't believe. They kept speaking evil of him. And finally, he just gave up and departed. He left the synagogue and went to teach somewhere else. Probably never set foot in the synagogue again. Uh, or maybe, but not in that situation. So he departed. Acts twenty two twenty nine. Straightway they departed from him, which they should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid because he knew he was a Roman and because he had bound him. So in those days, you could bound bind and or whip someone to get them to confess if they're not a Roman citizen. And they had bound and whipped Paul. And then Paul said, is it lawful to do this for a Roman? And he's like, yeah, how did you become a Roman? It's really expensive to do that. Paul said, I was born Roman. And that scared the daylights out of him. It's like, we're going to get in some major trouble. So anyway, he straightway departed from him. So in other words, please just take your stuff and go. Here's some money. Sorry we did it. Just leave, please. We want to forget this whole event happened. So please depart. Please apostatize. Please walk out the door and don't come back. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 8. For this thing I bethought, besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. This is when Paul had that... Um, uh, spirit from Satan that buffeted him. And three times he prayed, Lord, make this depart, make this apostatize, make this leave me. I would like this problem that I have to leave, and I would like to never even think about it again. But the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. This, this will help keep you humble. So, but in, the, in either case, it's depart. Well, I would like it to leave. Uh, I'd like it to apostatize, epistemy. Um, first Timothy four, one, the spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time, times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now that's an apostasy like we think, but still the concept is they did believe or they thought about becoming Christian or they grew up in the church or whatever. And at a certain point, they got indoctrinated by a false prophet and picked up and left. We all know people like that, kids that have grown up in our church and you think they're Christian. Next thing you know, they're off in some cult or they went to some college and now they're saying, I don't know if I really believe in a God or not. They've fallen for something. So they've departed from the faith. First Timothy 6, 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth suppose that gain is godliness. We could talk about that all day, this prosperity gospel. Gain is godliness. Now that's corrupt minds and disputing of the truth. From such people, withdraw yourself. So I guess the reason I depart is because I don't believe like they do. So from their point of view, I've apostatized. But the main idea here is 
I don't want to associate with you anymore. Not that I've changed my mind or anything. I'm just leaving because I don't want to be around that kind of person. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. Praise God. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In this case, it's kind of sort of an apostasy or doctrinal, where we're talking more about sin. So you could say, I am a Christian, I really do believe, but I have problems getting drunk or, or whatever, and I don't really want to change that. Well, you should depart from iniquity. So it may or may not be directly connected to doctrine, but it's sin. It's something that you should depart from. So it's not really apostasia, but more of a departure. And the last one we'll see here is from Hebrews 3.12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you that has an evil heart of unbelief that departs from the living God. And that I would definitely say is an apostasy. But in all these cases, some of them are, I leave the faith, or I leave you because I've changed my faith. And in other, other places, like the angel, gets Peter outside and says, now you go this way and I'm going home. So he just departs. So it's just the word depart. So with that in mind, let's look at here. These are some of the older Bibles and see how they translate it. So here's the St. King James 1611, which most of us are familiar with, and it translates it falling away in, in 2 Thessalonians. The Geneva Bible from 1608 translates it departing. When the departing comes, then this will happen. 1583 Biza Bible, departing. The 1582 Reims-Dewey Bible, that's the Catholic one, calls it revolt. And I thought that was interesting. Almost everybody's got departing because we look at it as an apostasy or departing from faith. The Catholics looked at it that way also and thought Protestants are the apostasy. So they're talking about when the revolt comes, that's the Protestant Reformation. So that's why they put revolt in there. Because the concept is not a revolt like we're going to attack you, but we just leave. That's the basic meaning of the word. 1676 Breaches Bible, departing. 1539 Kramer Bible, departing. 1535 Coverdale Bible, departing. And notice the, the old English spelling uh, with a Y-N-G-E, departing. Uh, 1526 Tyndale Bible, departing. Uh, 1384 Whitcliffe Bible, departing. And keeps on going back. So let's hop back to our um, uh, text here, and we'll look at this. So the point is, this falling away here could be an apostasy as far as a religious apostasy, or it could be just a departure. <clears throat> so let me read it to you both ways. Don't let anybody deceive you in any way, because that day, the seven-year tribulation, will not come unless first... There is an apostasy of faith in some sense. And after that apostasy, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Or we could read it this way. Don't let anybody deceive you in any way, because that day, the seven-year tribulation, will not come unless first there is a rapture or a departing. And then the man of sin will be revealed. That makes perfect sense if it's a, if it's a pre-trib rapture. Now, we know there is an apostasy coming, and we know there is a rapture coming, so it could be either or, but I just wanted to make you aware of this. And this will come into play as we get down here a little bit more. So, the rapture and or apostasy, then the man of sin is revealed. Verse 4 says, The one who opposes and exalts himself over everything to be called God, or every object of worship, so that as for him, he sets in the temple of God, setting himself forth actually to be God. So there has to be a rebuilt temple, a seven-year tribulation. In the midst of that, he sets in the, the temple, says, I'm Christ, and stops sacrifices. We see this in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, and so 
we go on down here. It says, do you not remember when I was with you? I told you these things. And this is one of the key verses here, six and seven. This is really interesting. Now you know the thing holding back. Well, in context, what were we talking about? The apostasy or rapture is the thing that holds back the seven-year period and the revealing of the Antichrist. That's what we're talking about. And remember back at the top, the subject is when our Lord comes back to gather us to him, not second coming. So in relation to the rapture, there is a departing, then the man of sin is revealed. So now he says, now you know what's holding back the seven-year tribulation and that man of sin for him to be revealed in his time. Something is holding back the revealing of the Antichrist in that seven-year period. So he goes on and tries to explain this. The mystery of lawlessness is already working. Only he who is holding back now, whatever this thing is that's holding it back, will continue to hold it back until it comes out of the midst. This is actually what the Greek says. It's translated different ways in different texts. And anytime you see something like this, you look at it and say, I have no clue what we're talking about. Well, if you have, if, if it's not normal English or normal Greek that you can just read and go, okay, I get it. Then it's got to be an idiom that means something. So when you look at the idiom out of the midst, uh, we see it in several places in the old manuscripts. In the book of Enoch, uh, Enoch is raptured, is taken to heaven. And it says that he is taken out of the midst of the earth. Same with Elijah when he's, when he's raptured. And so you've got all these other things uh, talking about a taking out of the midst, meaning a rapture. With that in mind, let me just look, show you one of these things. Here is, and this is eSword again. So eSword is a free program. And in eSword, they have Bibles, commentaries, dictionaries, and then they have other books, just stuff. And in here, I've got, and this is all free, you can download the Antinician Fathers. So this is the Antinician Fathers, Volume 7. And in here, there is uh, a guy by the name of uh, Victor, Victoranus, and he wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. This is the oldest commentary on the book of Revelation that we have that it still exists. It's about 240 AD. I don't necessarily agree with everything here, but I want you to look at this. This is interesting. This is his commentary on Revelation 15, 1 through 8. Verse 1 says, the, the, the book of Revelation, I saw another great and wonderful sign, the seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the indignation of God is completed. So that's the same thing ours says. We're talking, uh, that's, that's in the second half of the tribulation period in that last three and a half years. But what I want you to notice is he says this, and then he gives this commentary. This is just his opinion, but where would he get this opinion if it's not consistently taught by somebody? He says, for the wrath of God always strikes the obstinate people with seven plagues. That is perfectly, that's how he defines it, as it says in Leviticus. And these, the, these plagues that come in that last second half of the tribulation period shall be in the last time, look at what it says, when the church shall have gone out of the midst. So again, he understands, as it's always been taught, coming out of the midst or going out of the midst refers to a rapture. You're taken from the earth somewhere else. So when the church is caught up out of the midst of the earth or raptured, that's when you have the seven-year tribulation and the plagues. Now, some people might look at this and say, well, he's obviously a mid-trib person then. Uh, and the thing is, a lot of us think that there's the, sea, the um, seals, the bowls, no, seals, trumpets, and bowls, okay? And so a lot of us think that it's sequential. Some people think that the seals are in the first half, the bowls and the trumpets are kind of two things that are two different pictures for the same thing. And other people look at all three of them as just different pictures for the same thing. 
His opinion is that they are pictures of the same thing. So with that in mind, if the bowls, trumpets, and vials are all the same thing, I don't necessarily believe that. But if I thought that, or he thought that, and he says that the church goes out of the midst before they start, that's a pre-trib guy. Just want you to look at that. But the point is, the main point is, whether he's mid-trib or post-trib or whatever, he's using this phrase, out of the midst. So the wrath of God is poured out when the church is raptured. That makes sense. So now if we go back to this, he says, now you know the thing that holds him back for him to be revealed. We know the Antichrist is revealed when he signs the covenant starting that seven-year period. So the revealing of the Antichrist is held back by something that holds him back or restrains him. And this thing, whatever it is, continues until it comes out of the midst. That's an idiom. Very clearly means one and only one thing. The rapture. Well, what person, event, or people, or whatever are raptured that would no longer hold him back? It's not a single person, like in the book of Acts, when Philip was raptured from uh, <coughs> the desert where he was at back to a city. We're talking about the church. So with the ancient manuscripts of Enoch and, and Elijah and Victor's commentary, they all clearly indicate this as a rapture verse. So we look at this. Now you know what holds back the Antichrist, the seven-year tribulation. It is the rapture of the church. And again, that's what we're talking about, our gathering together into him. And that is exactly what this means if this is a rapture rather than a falling away, that there has to be a departure first, then the man of sin is revealed at the beginning of the seven-year period. Now, if this doesn't mean rapture, if it just means apostasy, like most of us think, it still fits. We're talking about a rapture. There's some sort of an apostasy. The man of sin is revealed. But specifically, what's holding back the man of sin sealed is that thing that's taken out of the midst, which again is the rapture. So no matter how you look at this, it's a pre-trib rapture. And I think it's really, really clear in a lot of these things. He goes on and says, and then the lawless one will be revealed once the rapture happens. Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume by the spirit of his mouth and brought to naught by the brightness of his presence. And again, that doesn't mean it happens right there at the beginning. We're talking about a series. The tribulation is only seven years long because it's ended by the Lord coming back. The Antichrist is a supernatural being and can't be stopped by human beings. So if the Lord didn't come back, he would be here for who knows how long. But it's only seven years because the Lord cuts it off. Uh, his coming is in the, the Antichrist is in the accordance of the working of Satan with all power, miraculous signs, and lying wonders. So they're fake or demonic. And in all deceit and unrighteousness in those being lost because they did not receive the love of the truth in order that for them to be saved. So we understand this, that people are deceived because they don't have a love of the truth. In other words, a love of scripture. If you study the scriptures, you'll have a correct understanding and you won't be deceived. Uh, like, for instance, a lot of my friends refuse to take the, um, the um, shot trying to say it right so nobody get me in trouble um, and because the idea of uh, not even the changing of DNA or anything but the concept of someone saying that you have to do XYZ or you can't come out into public and buy and sell that's what the Antichrist does with the mark of the beast now the mark of the beast doesn't come on the scene until the middle of the tribulation period we're gone way before that even if you're a mid-trib person we're still gone before that so we don't get to see that in full development, but that's not the point. If we know that technology is going this direction and it's going toward a bad way, it's up to us to resist. When we resist the Antichrist's kingdom and those kind of things, we pull it back, which is what we're supposed to be doing. And then the Lord has to take us home for this stuff to start. 
And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, if you didn't have a love of the truth and you didn't study prophecy, you wouldn't know any of that. And someone would come along and say, well, if you don't do this, well, if you go ahead and do it, it's just it helps people. It shows them that you care. Well, I suppose so, but it's still forbidden. So it's still that kind of a thing. You have to have a biblical understanding and your biblical understanding will make it very clear. So all of us that study the prophecies have the same attitudes, have mainly the same ideas. People that don't study the Bible at all, they don't have a clue how in the world we think. But we are to hold back the lawless one. This is also why it's a bad idea for a lot of us. And I, I have a lot of friends that do this. They say, well, the rapture's got to be around the corner. And it probably is. If that's the case, I have no time to witness or to help anybody or get anybody saved. Well, that might be the case also, but you still are called to do a job, whether the job works or not. And I've always I've told you guys that uh, in, the, in the old text, it talks about Noah and Methuselah preaching the gospel, preaching repentance for 120 years before the flood came. And they didn't have a single convert. Now, they're not stupid. So you know that they know two or three or four or five years into it, this isn't working. We might as well quit. Well, practically, I suppose so, but you keep doing it until God says don't do it anymore. You follow the, the law, or not the law, but follow God's will. So we need to keep witnessing, whether it seems like it's working or not. You really don't know. You could try to speak to somebody about the Lord, and he could say you're an idiot, cuss you out, walk away. As far as you are concerned, I know that guy didn't get saved, but he might go home. The Holy Spirit might work on his heart. He might get saved that night. Somebody else might do it. You don't know. So we need to keep witnessing. So we want to have a love for the truth. Uh, because they don't have a love for the truth, God will send them a working error or an, uh, uh, an error to believe the lie. And I think this is a really good translation. It's not any old lie. It's a specific lie that the Antichrist gives. That they may be judged, those who do not believe in the truth, but have delighted in unrighteousness. So I just wanted to share this with you today. So recap is basically this chapter 2 is because Paul talked to them about prophecy. He They didn't quite get it or had some problems. So he writes 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 talking about the rapture and how you don't need to worry about the timing because it's connected with Daniel 12, which is a pre-trib rapture. Then somebody writes this fake note about we're in the middle of the tribulation period, which can't be because we're still here. So he writes this and saying, don't worry about it because first there is a apostasy or rapture, one of the two, before the son of or the, the man of sin is revealed, before the start of the seven-year tribulation. And then we get down here and he actually tells us the thing that holds back the Antichrist in the seven year tribulation is it coming out of the midst, which according to the church fathers and the Dead Sea Scrolls and other things are a rapture, the rapture of the church. And so this, again, clearly demonstrates what we're talking about. So to us, it looks confusing to them back in those times when you use time, phrases like coming out of the midst. And those things, it's crystal clear. So we just have to go back and look at those things. But that's what I wanted to share with you. This is our Telegram channel. But I wanted to share with you that. One other thing I would say is we have, and we're going to go to the chat room here in a minute, but we have, uh, just to remind you, we have a Telegram channel. And you can get there. It's just BibleFacts.org without a dot. I, I don't think they allow dots on that. But uh, here is our um, front page, our um, website. And, of course, when we're broadcasting, we're always live here. But if you come down here to Telegram, we can click on it, and it comes up and shows you the channel. So if you just want to see what we're doing, then you can just come here and look. You don't need a Telegram account or anything like that. You can just look at it. If you want to join the channel with Telegram, you can get a Telegram account and join the channel. And it's BibleFacts.org. So um, actually, that's 
if you come here, it'll say if you want to open it in your Telegram channel, you just click open and there you are. So we have our uh, Bible Facts channel and then a chat room connected with it so we can talk. Uh, you can make comments, but you can follow us there with different things. Not much in there at the moment. We have 1,278 subscribers. Uh, so, but if you're wanting to just keep up on what we're doing, it's a good way to do it. Telegram seems to be a really good um, private non-censorship place to chat with people. And of course, if I pick somebody here that I talk to, like here's my wife, if I click on that, I can chat with her. I can also do an audio or video call. Oh, you guys can't see that. There we go. An audio or video call. And I can also do a broadcast, which I didn't do tonight. I forgot. But anyway, um, that's it's still a work in progress. So I can broadcast, for instance, to this. But I have to remember to actually go into Telegram and click I'm broadcasting and then click record or it doesn't do it. So they're still working on getting all the bugs out of it. But anyway, so that's what we're doing here with this. So just to let you know. So we'll go ahead to our um, chat room here and I'll see if we have any questions. Okay, one question. In your opinion, was the falling away or the rapture or the rebellion? What, oh, okay, was the falling away the rapture or rebellion against God? I believe it's the rebellion against God. I really don't know. Um, it could be either one. Technically, it is the departure. And it could be a departure from faith or it could be a departure from uh, the earth. And either way, you look at that verse when you look at the rest of the chapter we still have a pre-trib rapture. But the interesting thing about it is, is because if it is rapture, there is absolutely no debate and everybody should see that. But that's, I just wanted you to be aware of those things. <clears throat> um, Andy Woods is a big proponent of it being the rapture rather than uh, the apostasy. Uh, do you have a resource, book or other, that lists geographic names from the Bible and says what their names are today? For example, Kittim being Rome. I don't really have anything that's just a list like that, but we do have our prophecy um, book, which is, let me go to the bookstore here. That's the wrong one, this one. Uh, we have our Ancient Prophecies Revealed. So this one, you can always come here and click on it. We're setting these up, by the way. We have, it's in English, and it's a, there's an audio book. All of them are set up that way. None of them are in Spanish yet, but we're working on getting Spanish books too. But you'd be able to go to Amazon and get it. So this um, actually goes, we can go through here and see. I don't know if I can make that bigger or not, but this goes through a lot of the prophecies. So when we get to things like Kittim, uh, in Daniel or um, Tarshish, you know, in Isaiah and things like that, we can clearly define who they are. So that's about the the uh, best we have on that. <coughs> so like, for instance, everybody says Kittim properly is Cyprus, and it probably is, but it's an outpost at that time of Rome. There was no Cyprian Empire. There was a Roman Empire. So, I mean, now that it's over, we can know for sure what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, when Paul said falling away, if it's people falling away from the church, he would have to assume that the church would be worldwide because the church was just starting back then. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Uh, of course, the prophecies talked about all the Gentiles coming into the church and it becoming basically a Gentile type church. Um, the other thing that's mentioned is that the apostasy in general of everybody leaving the Christian church for something else is kind of a general apostasy. And it's been going on for a long time and is still continuing. 
And in the text in Greek, it seems like it's talking about an apostasy. Like we've been apostatizing for a long time, but there comes a time and all of a sudden, boom, there is an apostasy, a specific event. Uh, and if it's not the rapture, there's something interesting coming in the near future. So we'll have to see what it is. But it could be the same thing it talked about the Lord sending him a delusion to believe the lie. So it's again, it's it's kind of debatable, but in either case, I think it's pretty clear it's a pre-trib rapture. Doesn't it make more sense that the falling away would be the rapture? I can see it both ways, but and that's why I wanted to do this study. Oh, okay. One person here says that the NLT states rebellion. So that's that's kind of cool. So rebellion, kind of like a revolt, kind of like the Reams Dewey. So in that case, if that would be more accurate, a rebellion would be more like an apostasy. Again, though, it, it doesn't matter how you interpret that one verse. It could be either or, but with the other verses, it still makes it very, very clear. Okay, compared, the Isaiah scroll was translated by Peter Flint, uh, and the Isaiah verses Mr. Woodward uses as hard evidence cha that changes were made to the MT. The verse verses match the MT, not the... Uh, that's what we see a lot of times. Um, uh, Doug, um, in his book, Rebooting the Bible, and I know Doug, he's a good guy, uh, but he believes that the Septuagint is more accurate than the Masoretic text. I've always believed the opposite. And, and the reason behind this is because the uh, Septuagint, just looking at the Genesis and the, and the names and the, the numbers, uh, Genesis in the Hebrew says that Adam was 100 and, 130, I think it was 130, uh, when Seth was born. And in the Septuagint, it says 230. So it adds an extra 100 years. Well, which one of those is right? Well, the thing is, when you go through both the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, all the Hebrew text, there's two places in there that says to check uh, the numbers and, and the events with the book of Jasher. And the book of Jasher is very clear on all of its number system. And the number system agrees with the Hebrew completely. So just on that alone, I'm thinking if I'm obeying the scripture, comparing these two together, and Jasher agrees with the Hebrew, not the Greek, then I'm going with the Hebrew, you know, and so, but I can see why you do that. Plus the stories and the scrolls about who Melchizedek was and being Shem and that kind of stuff. If we go by the Septuagint dates, there's no way that Shem could have ever known Abraham. They'd be way, way too far apart. But the Hebrew dating system, they're right there. And there's all these stories about Abraham studying under Shem. So they've got to be in the same time period. But then we get the dead, the dead Sea Scrolls, and again, the Dead Sea Scrolls are fragmented, so we don't have too many things that have dates like that that we can check. But we do have about five or six, and they all agree with the uh, Hebrew version, not the Septuagint. So that's why I would pick the Masoretic text over that. Now, that being said, there are things in the Masoretic text that are different. So Paul, for instance, quotes, I think it's Isaiah, He's quoting it in uh, Hebrews, and he says, a body you have prepared for me. And when we look at the Hebrew in our Masoretic text, it doesn't say anything like that at all. And so the rabbis are saying, see, Paul kind of tweaked it a little bit. But when you look at the Hebrew uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Septuagint, they agree with Paul. And, of course, the rabbis wouldn't pay any attention to the Septuagint, probably. But the Dead Sea Scrolls agreeing with the way Paul interpreted it. And you see things like that. There's only, that I know of, three or four things like that, where you've got a half of a sentence that's totally different. But in, in those cases, if there's a Dead Sea Scroll that has that part of Scripture, it's going to agree with the New Testament. It always does. So that's really cool. We've got a few more few more uh, minutes here. <clears throat> if you have time, would you be able to explain how to apply the Lord's Prayer whenever we pray? I have never been taught this. Should I say it before I pray 
or is it a model for prayer? It's actually a model. Uh, the Lord wants us to have a, uh, a relationship with him rather than saying, you know, thus says the Lord, I petition thee for, you know, and using certain words or phrases or things like that. He wants you to say, Father, I have a problem and I need your help. Or Father, what can I do with, you know, for you today? Guide me. And he wants us to be uh, kind of real in that respect. But Jesus in that particular prayer basically is saying, make sure you are thankful for what's going on. You ask him for your, your daily needs and you uh, ask him to protect you from the evil. You try to follow proper doctrine. And he's trying to remind us and a, a good little model, I think, uh, is for that. It's a good question, though. Okay, another question. Where did the church fathers say speaking in tongues came from? Uh, basically, it is a spiritual gift. Um, the church fathers did say that uh, it's, it's a gift to be able to speak in another language as he himself used to speak. So Jesus could actually speak in all the different languages, which makes sense because he was Messiah. Um, there's church father records that talk about uh, the prayer, the, the language they got on the day of Pentecost, uh, when the persecution came, they went to countries where those languages were spoken and used those gift to preach the gospel. There's even uh, uh, texts that talk about them translating the Old and the New Testaments later into those languages using that particular gift. Um, the scrolls talk about the idea of prophets being able to speak multiple languages and being able to read the thoughts of people. And when you have those two gifts, which is basically prophecy and tongues put together, uh, it creates what was called in the scrolls a guardian, uh, which, you know, is really cool. You could definitely be a guardian for that. So there's lots of different things like that, but it's just something that um, occurred. I don't necessarily know that it occurred a lot in the Old Testament, but there's some records like that. Now, that being said, there are people that do fake tongues today and all the gifts are fake. There's real healings and people that manipulate or, or fake things. So you got to be real careful. Just because someone speaks in tongues doesn't mean that they are filled with the spirit or it, it, that you'd have to figure out if it's real or not. So those are things you got to be real careful with. Uh, one of the things that I always wonder about is when you have these people that say that they are a prophet so-and-so. Well, according to the scriptures, and I could be wrong, but the way I read it, a real prophet doesn't go around saying he's a prophet. And they usually don't have a clue of what a real prophet is. So anytime someone says, I'm a prophet or a prophetess, I really question it. I'd be respectful because they might be one. But then you examine their doctrine, and if you find them to be false, then you kick them out the door. Uh, what is the name of, okay. Oh, the name on the Telegram site. It is, oh, it's Bible Facts Org without the dot. Oh, I didn't mean to do that one. I meant to do this one. Um, so this one here with the S in it is what we have on the site. So on here from our homepage, uh, it will, that one is this one here and it will take you to, uh, the picture. But if you just click on this, uh, it will take you to um, that, that one, and you can come in from there. So so it's just biblefacts.org. Uh, so it should be, um, you know, let me look at it real quick just to make sure. So if you can see this. Okay, so the direct link, if you're already in Telegram, is t.me slash biblefacts.org, no dot. And if you uh, are doing it this way, like down here with this one, it's uh, t.me slash s slash Bible Facts Org. So the slash s part just takes you to a web page so you can just see our public channel. If you want to subscribe to it in Telegram, just go there. And either way, it's Bible Facts Org. 
no dot. And okay, here, see if there's any more questions. Love watching Andy Woods, yes. Okay. Do you think any further falling away, the further falling away could come with UFO alien disclosures on what they're prepping now uh, in the Catholic Church? It definitely could be. Um, um, any kind of a lie uh, to make you do something to, to mess you up or to lead you down a certain path is something that would happen. So if demons finally manifested, but the explanation is that it's our brothers from another dimension, you know, that CERN opened up or, or whatever. I don't necessarily believe in any of that, but the concept of whatever works, you know, the propaganda to get people to accept it. So if you say these are nice people from another dimension, we finally were able to contact them and they want us to do genetic manipulation, they want us to do whatever, then, you know, uh, it's a definite possibility. See, that's why it's important for us to go back and, and look at the old scrolls. In the Bible, we just have Genesis 6 that talks about the angels, or the, the sons of God and the daughters of men. It makes like one or two verses and it was a really bad thing and doesn't give us any more information. In the other scrolls, it tells us all about what happened, how they did it, how they did the genetic tampering, uh, what happened with it, the civil war that developed out of it, and then finally the flood. So a lot of extra information. You know, and it sounds like science fiction, but then the Dead Sea Scroll, it's the Book of Giants, for instance. It tells you how to do the genetic manipulation. Uh, it doesn't tell you enough to finish it yourself, but it shows you how it's done. And come to find out, that's exactly what we do today when we take a, a lime and a lemon and make a lemon. You know, how you splice things together and combine things. So really interesting in that way. Um, so all of the old things we need to pay attention to. Uh, mainly uh, sticking with scripture, and it's very important to study prophecy. Let's see. Oh, would you repeat the source of the, the thing holding back the church? What was the name of that person? It was, um, <clears throat> I call him Victor, Victoranus, I believe. And it is, let me find it. So in e Sword. If you go to and download the Antonician Fathers, let me run this down a little bit so we can see it easier. There we go. This is the um, reference library. So it's Antonician Fathers, Volume 7. And the guy's name is Victoranus. And it's there's two books here on the Apocalypse. It's commentary on the book of Revelation. It's in the second one on Revelation 15, 1 through 8. And you can get that other places online, but it's just Victoranus, V-I-C-T-O-R-I-N-U-S. Lots of cool guys back then. And again, it's not that we necessarily agree with all of his theology, but the way he uses the old terms. And Animity says, don't forget to give a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to uh, see these things later. Um, uh, join the membership if you want to donate or be in the chat room and thanks to all of you guys that have done that and also through our paypal channel uh so all of that really helps and those of you that buy the books and a lot of people buy the books and give them out to their pastors and other things uh on that token we're still right now i'm working on uh, the damascus covenant translations getting fairly close to being done hopefully we should have maybe it finished by this fall something like that hopefully it's got a lot of really interesting things. If you go back through some of the old uh, YouTube channels, there's a lot of the stuff from there that we've been talking about over the months. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, that's a good question. Could the verse mean a falling away and the rapture? Um, I suppose it could. Um, again, the cool thing about it is it's, it's either or, maybe both, but either or. But no matter how you interpret it with the other verses, it's still pretty rock solid.
Can you say a little more about Philip being translated or raptured? Where in the scripture in, is, is that in Acts? Um, I think it's like chapter 7 or 8. Um, basically, Philip uh, is told to, uh, there, there's an Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, he's someone from Queen Candace's court. He's Jewish. He came up to do the festival. Uh, he sees what's going on. Now he's going back from the festival. And the Holy Spirit directs Philip to go down and talk to him. So he catches him on the way going from Jerusalem back toward Ethiopia. And he comes up and talks to him and he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless somebody explain it to me? So he begins to explain it to him, talk to him about um, uh, the Lord. He understands and he accepts the Lord as his savior. And then he says, well, since I believe, uh, what hinders me to be baptized? There's a pond over there. So he said, fine. So he, they stop. Philip baptizes him. And then it says when he comes up out of the water for the baptism, all of a sudden Philip is gone because he was harpazoed, which is another term, a Greek term for the rapture. He was instantly caught away to another city to do uh, a work for the Lord. So that's an example of being raptured from one place on earth to another place on earth. It happened to the prophet Elijah a lot. He would be taken up kind of in a whirlwind, but just instantly go somewhere else. So our Lord has done many, many amazing things through different prophets, which is another interesting thing. That's why when I uh, run across somebody that says, I'm prophet so-and-so, I'm thinking like, okay, it should be really easy for you to prove it. Tell me something I don't know do something like Elijah did, you know. Of course, they always say, well, that part of the stuff doesn't happen anymore. It's like, yeah, I don't think you're a prophet. But anyway, it's it's interesting to see. Okay. We're finished with that. So we'll go ahead and say good night at this point. We'll be back next Monday, and hopefully I'll have some uh, new information on the, the scrolls that we've been working on. Lots of interesting idioms. I'm trying to create a, um, uh, a dictionary in the back for all of the idioms trying to, as they explain it. So it should be pretty interesting. So I'll go ahead and say good night. God bless you guys, and we will see you next week.